Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I was going to just pause for effect. Thank you. Welcome to Summit Education Initiatives 2021 Community Report. We are happy to have you. We are grateful that you took time from your busy schedules to join us. We appreciate your partnership and your continued engagement in this work. My predecessor, Darren Weimer, began this work with me a little over 10 years ago. I took over the executive director position about 18 months ago, and I've had to make a few changes. For example, our staff meetings used to begin at 8.30 a.m., and now they begin at 9. This is a radical departure for Darren, who wanted all the meetings to begin at 7. So. What hasn't changed is our commitment to the work and our commitment to this community and to collaboration. And we hope this evening to be able to share with you uh, where we are and where we hope to go together in our work. I would like to thank our sponsors this evening. First and foremost, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, Lepo Rents, who's really making this event possible this evening. Thank you, Lepo Rents. Also, our partners at University of Akron and Summit County Department of Job and Family Services under the leadership of County Executive Eileen Shapiro. Thank you for your sponsorship and your support. Finally, we'd also like to thank our friends at the Akron Metropolitan Housing Authority, Connexus NEO, the Summit Educational Service Center, and the YMCA for their support. Thank you all for your support. Much of this work wouldn't be possible if we weren't supported by a very strong board of directors. Our board is, I believe, the envy of many other organizations' boards, and I am grateful for their leadership and their guidance through these challenging times. If you are a member of the Summit Education Initiative Board of Directors, either active or emeritus, would you please stand at this time so that you can be recognized? Thank you very much. All of our board members and our executive committee are listed on the inside of your uh, programs on the back cover. And just take a moment uh, sometime this evening to make note of our um, leadership here in the organization. It is my pleasure at this time to introduce our chair of the Summit Education Initiative Board of Directors. And um, if you've ever worked with him before, you know that he also becomes a mentor and a friend, and I am grateful for uh, his leadership and um, the support that he's offered me. So uh, if we could welcome Glenn Lepo to the front, please. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here in two roles. I'm here both as the CEO of the sponsor organization and also the board chair. So it's only going to take about 30 minutes to go through my talk. <laughs> I, go, you th I thought I was serious. Okay. Um, no, uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it is a great honor to be the chairperson of the board. Uh, this is a fabulous organization. I have lots of things I'd love to say about that, but uh, it is great uh, to have a board like you'll see on the inside cover. A very competent, uh, very capable group of people who can basically get anything done if we put our minds to it. So it's wonderful to have that uh, support in the organization. Uh, but what I want to talk about just a little bit is my journey to this place. Uh, it really started with Leadership Akron. I was in the Leadership Akron program and, and they say, you know, what do you want to accomplish uh, when you get out of here? What, what problem do you want to tackle? And I had this little problem I wanted to solve, which was called breaking the cycle of generational poverty. Just a little, little small thing. And I, I worked my way down and I eventually decided I should focus on education because I thought education was the key to uh, breaking that cycle. And there's a lot of other things, obviously a lot of other things that come into play, 
but I really whittled it down because I knew I couldn't affect everything. I could just really affect one thing. So housing instability and all the other stuff that plays into breaking that cycle weren't my equation. I was going to narrow it down to just let's focus on education. And then I find out, well, you know, there's this great thing that Summit Education Initiative and other folks are working on getting everybody out of the high school, employed, enrolled, or enlisted. That's fabulous. The best way to, again, solve generational poverty, have everybody come out, they got a productive job, sounds great. Okay, so let's focus on that. Well, hold on, you gotta have good math skills to get there. So ninth grade math becomes the, the pivotal point. Oops, hold on, you gotta have third grade reading skills because if you can't pass reading in third grade, that's when you transition from learning how to read to reading to learn. You know, the truck train comes from Pittsburgh, the train comes from Cleveland. Well, if you can't read the story, you can't do the math. So you're toast if you don't have three, third grade reading skills. So let's go back there because that's where you gotta start. Uh-oh, now kids aren't ready for kindergarten. If they're not ready for kindergarten, then shoot, they can't get third grade the reading down. Oh, darn it. So then you go, well, what, what impacts third, kindergarten readiness, housing instability, challenges with <laughs> get back all the same stuff that I was trying to avoid with the big picture. Uh, it all impacts what we're doing. So uh, I think you'll hear some of that story tonight. Um, hopefully you get to hear the passion. I know some of these folks are a little nervous about talking in front of a bunch of people. Just breathe. <laughs> the thing about keep thinking of people naked doesn't work for me. Uh, maybe for some of you, but not me. Uh, so. Uh, I just want to say thank you all for coming and supporting SEI, supporting the students throughout Summit County, because uh, that's really why we're here tonight, is to share what unfortunately is a little bit of a challenging situation right now, but if you came here expecting that everything got rosier in the last couple of years, you may want to sit down first. <laughs> and I'm passing it to, back to Matt. Thank you, Glenn. So um, I appreciate you diffusing that a little bit. If you came for a rosy outlook, um, you're not gonna have one, but if you came expecting a rosy outlook, you really haven't been paying attention to what's been going on in the world. Um, so what we're here today to do is to talk about where we are and share some of our thoughts about how we're gonna move forward. Speaking of moving forward, it was uh, famed Ohio State football coach, Woody Hayes, who said, you win with people. And I am very grateful to be supported by an amazing team at Summit Education Initiative, uh, many of whom are new and have never actually been to this event before. Um, but we wouldn't be ready for this event were it not for the team. So first, I would like to say that if you are enjoying the evening, um, you can thank Annie Boyer, Julian Corrette, and Kay Rowe. So Annie, Julian, and Kay, I'm going to thank you for the evening. I hope everybody else also thanks you for the evening. If things went right, it was because of them. If there is a hiccup or a glitch in what happens this evening, it is because of me, I assure you. And many of the other members of the team you're going to get to meet throughout the evening. Um, also, our, their names are in, printed in the program. And um, we look forward to you uh, deepening your relationship with all of our partners here. I'm now uh, going to turn things over to Diana Kingsbury. They don't let me talk about numbers anymore. So uh, Diana is going to take over from here. Diana? Thank you, Matt. And good evening, everyone. My name is Diana Kingsbury, and I'm the Director of Research An and Analytics at SEI. And it's my pleasure to be here with you this evening and highlight some of the key data points from this last school year. I'd like to begin tonight's data conversation with our cradle to career arrow. This arrow represents the critical transition points that each student encounters during their school careers from kindergarten readiness to adulthood. These are significant milestones where success at one is highly predictive of success at the next. We know that each transition point in and of itself is an important indicator of how a student is doing. The earlier we can get students on the path to success, the easier it is to keep them there. 
At SCI, we report aggregated data at each transition point to assist our partners and the community in understanding student achievement and attainment across the county. We believe that tracking student success at each transition point helps us better understand the needs of our students. We share and report this data and facilitate conversations around it so that as partners in this work, we can move the needle towards a successful future for Summit County students. And to illustrate what this looks like in practice, at your tables, you'll find updated scorecards that report our latest data. Many of you will be familiar with the format of our scorecard from years past. You will also see it displayed here on the screen. And the data reported on this scorecard represents aggregated outcomes from all 17 school districts in Summit County at each of our critical cradle to career transitions. We present data from across the county because these are all our students. Bringing about the systemic changes that are necessary to move the needle on these indicators requires all of us. On the scorecard, you'll see each of our transition points, along with this year's trends in ethnicity, as well as performance overall. You'll also see our projected goals for each point. Most of the data reported on this scorecard is from our most recent school year, as of the spring, with the exception of kindergarten readiness, which reports the 2019-2020 outcomes. One year ago, student, schools had the option of administering either the KRA or another assessment of their choice. Since the KRA wasn't uniformly administered, we don't have the data that is representative of all districts from last school year. However, when this year's KRA data becomes available this winter, we'll plan to update our information. It should come as no surprise that student success, student success across the cradle to career continuum has declined. We know that as a community, we have our work cut out for us to close the gaps that we're seeing in these outcomes. Our current situation is even more challenging because in our last scorecard, we are experiencing some of the highest levels of achievement, attainment, and equity we've seen since we've begun this work. The largest gains we were seeing at that time were among our students of color. While the current situation is challenging, however, we are confident we can move forward once again. To put this in perspective, each cohort of students at each transition point represents around 5,000 students. For every 10% gain toward our goal we want to see, this translates to moving 500 students forward. We are also well aware that the long-term consequences of the pandemic will be felt for years to come. We can see examples of this in the current data when we consider college persistence. You'll see that this past year, college persistence remained relatively stable, where students who started college before the pandemic returned to school at similar rates as previous years. However, there was a 5% decline among students who are enrolling in college for the first time. Assuming persistent rates remain stable, this will translate to nearly 400 fewer students in the pipeline as we've seen in previous years. This carries implications for an already challenged labor market where we could see fewer individuals entering the workforce with a college degree in two to four years. We can also consider the declines we're seeing in eighth grade math. According to the current data, there was a 14% decline in eighth grade math achievement. Given the size of this cohort of students, this equates to roughly 650 students who will be significantly less likely to meet our ninth grade success indicator which we know is a predictor of college readiness at the end of high school. As I mentioned previously, each transition point carries implications for the ones that follow. Declines in success at one point can carry forward to others. From an equity perspective, between this year's scorecard and 2019's, we saw a fairly, fairly equal decline in eighth grade math achievement among our white and African-American students. Both populations experienced similar declines. However, because the exi existing gap between these groups of students was already wide, the decline in achievement among African-American students is much more impactful. As it currently stands, fewer than one in five African-American students left middle school earning a proficient or higher score 
on their eighth grade math tests in the spring of 2021. If our goal is equity, we're going to have to accelerate the achievement of our students of color. In considering this further, we are aware that students who experienced a decline in achievement due to the pandemic will require support to close the gap, in addition to ensuring the current cohort of students can meet with success. Addressing the needs of students who experience a decline in achievement is critical, while also supporting each cohort of students at each level of the pipeline, particularly those who are most vulnerable. These are just two examples of how the data can be interpreted in real world terms. Each of these percentages represents how our students are faring on the whole. It's important to also consider that each data point represents a collective of individual students with individual needs and individual challenges. It will require our collective efforts to reverse these trends. This past year and a half, we were all witnesses to the unprecedented burden the pandemic placed on our world, and in particular, our healthcare system and healthcare providers. When cases surged, we saw the toll it took, where limited supplies and resources translated to limited capacity to deliver patient care. There were more critically ill patients than the system was designed to support. We can consider the education system operating in the same way. Our school partners and our out-of-school time programs are trying to assist current students while also addressing the critical needs of many students who transition to a new school year with a lower probability of success than previous years. While these are challenging and sobering numbers, we're encouraged that each and every one of you in this room are committed to securing educational success for all students in Summit County. The last time we met, we witness all-time highs in our scorecard. We're confident we can get there again. You'll see examples of some of the work we're doing as we move through the program. And later on, I'll also be sharing an approach to this work that requires a broad coalition of individuals and organizations that are necessary to move forward. And we do believe we can get there together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kingsbury. That was excellent. I appreciate your insight. So we've been saying equity and achievement a lot in the past year. And that's because we know at Summit Education Initiative that we cannot have one without the other. Our mission is to increase personal and regional prosperity through educational attainment. And we argue that it serves our own personal interests to focus on equity. We will not achieve our goals as a community without addressing existing systemic inequities that exist within our programs and our policies and our practices. And I know they don't let me near the numbers all the time, but I did grab some numbers to illustrate this point. <clears throat> They didn't know that I was grabbing these numbers. <laughs> should, they should change the password. Here. <laughs> so um, what you see here is uh, two different populations. The dark blue column is uh, coming from the American Community Survey census data, representative of the, distribu the demographic distribution of all residents of Summit County, everyone in Summit County and their distribution. And in the lighter columns, that is the uh, ethnic distribution of students who are attending public school districts in Summit County in grades pre-K through 12. Our schools, our community, our nation is becoming more diverse. And if we want achievement, we must have equity. There is no other way around it. So we've been thinking a lot about how do we frame our own thinking and our own work at Summit Education Initiative. And what we've decided is that equity and achievement should be at the center of every conversation that we have. We should never pursue one without the other. 
but all of our conversations as a part of our rich history of focus on um, data and evidence, all conversations should be informed by evidence. Evidence should be that thread that runs through all of our work. And so looking forward and taking a cue from Diana, who said that we know that we cannot do this work alone and it's gonna take the entire community. Our approach is that we will engage with you, engage with our partners, engage with the community. We will empower you to see what we see, to identify opportunities for improvement. We will work with you to enhance your programs, practices, or policies, to identify what is working. And when we know what is working, we will work with you to expand that, to take it to scale so that these things that we know are making a difference in the lives of students and families become the way we do things in Summit County. We want you to know our commitment and our values. And in everything that we do, you should hold us accountable for this, that we will be student-centered, that we will be collaborative, that all of our decisions will be evidence-based, that we will be inclusive, and we will be trustworthy. These are the values that we will be known by as an organization and as individuals within that organization. And these are the values that we seek in our partner organizations. We're seeking organizations with similar values and the capacity to advance our goals around equity and achievement. And it is with great pride then that I share with you the first three strategic, three strategic collaborative relationships that we have established at Summit Education Initiative. Our friends at Community Action Akron Summit, Project Grad Akron, and Akron Urban League. The idea here behind a strategic collaboration agreement is that when we are thinking about opportunities to increase equity or achievement, we will first think of these partners in the community. They have established relationships and credibility and trust. They have been doing the work and they will be our partners in the field. Aside from all of our other partners that we continue to remain committed to, we will learn from these key partners about the opportunities that we have to address the needs of our most challenged students and families. I wanna thank the members of these three organizations for their trust in us and their support. I also wanna thank our friends at Akron Metropolitan Housing Authority um, who have been engaged with us in these conversations as well. And we're beginning to, have, um, to begin the process of having another strategic collaborative relationship with AMHA. And I would be remiss if I did not also thank in person my dear friend, Jackie Silas Butler, who has become a thought partner in this work for me and, um, and a nice you know, guiding light and somebody I know I can call and we can just sort of figure things out together. So thank you, Jackie. And thank you for all three of those organizations and, and their willingness to partner with us. So thank you. But it's not just gonna be programs or individual organizations in order to move this needle. It's gonna take the entire community. And for that, I'm gonna turn things over to Laura DeCola, our Director of Strategic Initiatives and Policy, so she can let you know kind of how things work and feel now. Thank you. So as Matt said, my job is sort of to give you a sense of how we are, are all going to work together to achieve um, great success for our community and our students. I'm gonna lay out in broad terms, the framework and the structure that we've put in place to align our efforts and harness the power of your work, all of our partners. Then we will get to the really exciting stuff in my um, opinion. We're gonna be hearing from our team of network facilitators about some real life examples of what this work looks like in action. But first let's take a few moments to define what SEI means when we say collective impact what it is and what it isn't. And this is one of those phrases that I'm sure most of us have come across or heard, um, but maybe we don't all have exactly the same understanding of exactly what we mean by collective, uh, collective impact. 
some people automatically think collective impact means collaboration. They think it's maybe the trendy new word for collaboration. Certainly collaboration is nothing new. And of course, no one does it better than us here in Summit County. We're pretty um, much rock stars at collaboration. But collaboration is not the same thing as collective impact. Although collaboration is essential, collective impact is fundamentally different. It is distinguished primarily by who is at the table and how the work is framed and structured. So first the who. Collective impact is an approach that unites diverse community partners to improve outcomes and transform systems. By definition, it's multi-system, it's cross-sector. It's all these things we're talking about and bringing all of us together to tackle this problem. At its core, collective impact is a shared recognition that no single organization, no sector, no system, no player has the ability to solve our major challenges by itself. But equally important is the how. Collective impact is a very specific structured way of working together. And the defining piece of this is the backbone, a centralized infrastructure that coordinates and aligns all these efforts across all of the sectors and systems that are working to make an impact. So SEI is our community's backbone for the collective impact efforts to achieve and increase uh, educational attainment. In this role, SEI convenes multi-sector players from all different systems, all different segments, and facilitates a structured process that leads to a common agenda, common goals, common vision, shared metrics, ongoing communications and improvement, and mutually reinforcing activities among all of us. All of these are the defining features of collective impact. And since a picture is worth a thousand words, I wanna share this picture, which is how we would visually represent collective impact. In this photo, this cute little child is blissfully unaware of all the systems that are in place to keep her safe. All of these strands, all of these components, all of these little pieces of the net are all essential and are all working seamlessly together. But if there is one rip or hole in that net, or one weak point where it dips down, or maybe one of the anchors along the side of the pool is rusted or comes loose, this child can easily slip through that net. So this illustrates the concept that all of us, all systems, all players need to interweave, work together, work seamlessly to create an effective net. But what we love most, I think, about this picture is that the net, the system, is proactive. It's preventive. It is designed to keep that child safe. It's not designed to support a baby or a child who has already fallen into the water. That's what we mean by collective impact. So now we know what it is. How does this work unfold in our community? And how have we organized ourselves as a community to effectively move this change forward? We've done this by forming two broad steering committees. Many of you um, are actively engaged in or have been participants in uh, the first of those, First Things First, which is our early childhood steering committee. We define early childhood as that period of time, prenatally, all the way through third grade. And the second steering committee is the as of yet unnamed adolescent to adult, which covers everything after. Um, and I will assure you on this yet unnamed adolescent to adult, it is not second things second. It is not big kids first things first, although those have been thrown around. But what a steering committee is and does is it sets the direction and it drives the work forward by helping to set those big overarching goals and identify those big strategic buckets that we wanna to work together towards, um, all associated with a shared common community vision. So who is on the steering committee? Uh, these are our system leaders, our key thought partners and critical partners all across multiple systems and sectors. They're the ones that have the authority within a system or within an organization to commit and direct resources towards this work. They can empower their staff, their team, or their resources to lift the work um, and, and have the ability to say, go. 
So the real part of the work, not the real part, that's a terrible way of saying that, <laughs> the, the actual day-to-day -day closer to the ground um, takes place within strategic committees. These are the committees that have been formed to address broad strategic areas that the steering committee has identified or blessed as the areas to move forward. The committee work is led and directed by community partners who are serving in leadership roles in partnership with community members from cross-sector organizations all across the county. Strategic committees are responsible for coordinating and advancing the efforts within their particular focus area. They're responsible for sharing updates back with the steering committee and identifying needs for additional resources to address identified areas of need. And then the third piece of this triad um, is the Strategic Leadership Committee, which is really those same people, this, the chairs of each of the operating committees, along with a few other key advisory members that meet regularly to ensure alignment and collaboration across the strategies so that we're not working in silos. So what does this look like? Here is what it looks like in First Things First. You can see at the top, the steering committee, um, the bridge between the um, committees that are represented below is the committee of the strategic leadership committee. And then um, at the bottom level in its own little ecosystem is the structure of the committees. The blue round circles are the substantive committees that are tackling uh, the substantive identified need. For example, uh, safe and nurtured, which is um, ensuring that all children are in a safe, warm, nurturing relationship with, with their caregiver or their parent and are focused at this time on maternal depression. So it's a substantive area with a strategic fo focus. The strategic committees that are depicted in green boxes kind of cutting across the circle of, of, of uh, substantive committees are our backbone committees. Um, communication to ensure we're all aligned and speaking with one voice, data and metrics so that we have shared data, shared benchmarks to hold us accountable and to know what's working and what's not. And then the piece in the middle called essential connections, which is designed to build bridges between the committees, to think about um, an infrastructure that, that allows us to share more effectively and that brings partners to the table or makes connections among the work as needed. And the other thing that's super important about this slide that I don't want you to miss is to, to notice the arrows. The arrows are going up and down and around between each of these components of our structure. And that is to depict the information flow. The work from the ground informs the strategies up, the strategies up and the thought leadership informs down and the work that's going on in each of the committees is informing each other. So it's a, it's a robust um, ecosystem that's designed to, to really align along those, those grounds. Um, we do not have a structure for the Adolescent to Adult Steering Committee yet. Uh, we're in those processes in the midst of working sessions now. Um, the structure will look the same. The committee names, the committee's um, focus will be different um, and it will emerge from the work that's taking place now. So we spent a lot of time describing the structure. What you'll notice in orange are two other types of structures within our ecosystem that I'd like to describe. Where the visible activity of all this work and all these um, planning and conversations is taking place, it's where it really starts to appear is through the vehicles that we're calling collaborative action networks, CANs, or collaborative action teams, CATs. So we like to call these cans and cats. If you know Matt, you know, he likes those catchy little, little phrases, illiterate phrases. So in the next portion of our program, our team of network facilitators will share a little bit more about the cans and cats, what they are, how they operate, as well as some of the great work that's coming out of them. So first up is Dan Whitaker, our adolescent to adult network facilitator. Thank you, Laura. Um, so as the Adolescent to Adult Network Facilitator at SEI, uh, one of my primary roles is to facilitate the collaborative action networks uh, that are the middle grades and ready high school uh, network. Um, these networks bring together 156 educators from 40 schools across the county, across the county to collectively strategize and 
co-develop school transformation plans uh, designed to improve academic outcomes from middle school through post-secondary readiness. Um, this results in the implementation of programs, policies, and practices within each school building. Uh, through this work, SEI and our partner schools have the capacity to impact the lives and improve outcomes for 26,607 students. So while this is one example of a collaborative action network, um, it is one of many. Uh, so what is a collaborative action network? Uh, very broadly, a CAN, uh, as we call them, is a group of practitioners generally from related fields um, that come together and align their uh, efforts around a shared vision, shared outcomes, and a shared, a common system of measurement. The primary function of a CAN is to move from talk to action. Uh, what we mean by this is we begin with strategic discussions to identify priorities, develop a plan of action, and implement a strategy or strategies that will produce measurable results. Uh, key to the success of any collaborative action network is a uh, structure of shared accountability. Um, when SEI convenes uh, a CAN, we do not do so, or convenes or facilitates, we do not do so as an authority figure that can dictate the work or tell our partners what to do. Rather, our partners set goals and hold each other accountable to move, play their role in moving the work forward. Ultimately, uh, Collaborative Action Networks provides the framework for colleagues from many different schools, organization, and institutions from across the county to share both their challenges and successes uh, and identify best practices that can be replicated uh, across the county to serve more students. And with that, I will introduce my colleague, Danielle Curry Bentley, our Early Childhood Network Facilitator. Hello. Like my colleagues, along with my other responsibilities, I facilitate collaborative action networks or CANs, such as the 40 readiness, 40 readiness coalitions in Summit County. When the CAN reaches a place where another work must begin as a network, we form a CAT or collaborative action team so that the work of the CAN continues moving forward. An example of a CAT that I am currently working with is in the creation of an early learning resource kit. Two very large partners from our CANs identify the need for a resource that is designed with three to early five-year-olds in mind. We are, we are empowering experts to move to collaborative action. The team took, sorry. The team took the 16 for success skills and decided amongst those 16, what are essential for our age group. From those, we identified 10 that are most essential. Our next step was be, was, has been in defining those tools as concisely as possible to meet those 10 skills. We came to a five plus five idea where there are five tools for kids and five resources for parents. Once we began looking around our group, we noticed there are no parents. And while we are all experts and professionals in the field, we cannot move a step forward without bringing the parents that we will be using, that who will be using this resource. So each person has taken on the task of reaching out to multiple parents to bring one to two from each sector. For example, uh, students with differing abilities, English language learners, uh, fostering and relative care. Our next steps will be in hearing from them what they believe would be both academic and fun. As you can all attest, we have all pivoted to a more computer generated environment. With this as an example, with this, this is an example of one of our brainstorming um, sessions in a virtual world. 
Our team of experts and professionals come from these community partners. It's, re it's rewarding for me to be a part of this process. So now I'd like to turn it over to um, my colleague, Dr. Pia Chatterjee, Network Facilitator, Programs and Partnerships. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our annual report to the community, Our Students, Our Future, Our Success. Thank you, Laura, Dan, and Daniel for setting out a very clear illustration of a collaborative action network and collaborative action team here at SEI. To reiterate their descriptions, SEI has organized um, collaborative action networks to achieve continuous outcome improvement aligned with the critical credit to career indicators on the continuum. Whereas when we're trying to accomplish a specific task or an objective within the network in a task or time bound manner, we form the collaborative action teams or the CATS. I'm Pia Chatterjee, the network facilitator for programs and partnerships at SEI. Apart from all the other responsibilities, I lead and I facilitate a very important CAN or collaborative action network, the out of school time network or the OST network. Dan and Daniel work with our school partners who are already structured and organized and are aiming to achieve continuous improvement within the school structure and organized structure. But think of America after 3 p.m. Think of American kids of working parents. Think of the urban inner city youths. Think of children of color. Think of children with limited English proficiency. The CDC reports a post-pandemic estimate of 54 million students in American schools, children and youth out of which 8 million students are heading to after-school programs after 3 p.m., which roughly translates to 15% of the total student population. They need help with academics. They need help with social well-being. They need overall wraparound services after school serve them during the daytime hours. And Summit County is no different. Does SEI's role as a data-driven backbone organization end here? Will we do justice to our goals of achieving increased equity and continuous increase in student success in Summit County without considering the out-of-school time partners? We won't. No. That's why the answer is the out-of-school time network or the OST network. We serve 85 strong, active out-of-school time partner organizations with live, actionable data on more than 5,100 students in the County of Summit, across more than 400 out-of-school time sites and more than 300 robust out-of-school time programs. We here at SCI talk a whole lot about evidence through research. We talk about data dashboards. We talk about the data story to help our partners inform decisions and direct actions. At this juncture, it is equally crucially, it is equally crucial for our out of school time partners to access these pieces of evidence in an understandable and actionable format so that their ongoing positive impact is more directed, is more action-driven. The OST network website, or we fondly call it the portal, is the answer. SEI's OST network meetings provide our partners across Summit County the opportunity to come together, to share resources, to form collaborative action teams together to break out sessions who would have otherwise not come together. The fair part trained out of school time individuals and programs 
They can log in the portal and access live student level school information as we here at SCI broker between the schools and the out of school time programs. We have now renovated to a brand new website, as you can see on the screen. And the data points available to our out of school time partners are like those available to our other partners as well. It's just one of a kind in Ohio and for that matter in the nation, which we are so very proud of. And we are honored and thankful to our funders for that. We are working in creating a universal framework through this collaborative action network, the OST network. We are working towards measuring the social emotional development of students in K through 12 out of school time settings. We are also working in building a comprehensive structure for measuring the out of school time program quality. These form are very recent cats through the OST can. We believe that students are not just the academic records. They are not just the scores. They are not just numbers. They are their feelings, their emotions, their aspirations, their perceptions. They are the product of our whole child approach. We have a continuous holistic student success in the Summit County, and we can continue to do that through equity, and we can continue to do that through collaboration only when we consider quality out of school time programs targeting academic outcomes and well being with social emotional development at the center. And now I call upon our Director of Research and Analytics, Dr. Diana Kingsbury, back on the podium. Thank you, Pia. In our look at the scorecard earlier in the program, we saw that the pandemic contributed to declines in achievement and attainment across nearly the entire cradle to career continuum. Addressing the needs of students will require broad community collaboration where multiple systems work together for a common goal. As you heard from Laura, Danielle, Dan, and Pia, we're approaching much of our work in this way with a goal for collective impact. First Things First was just one of the examples, a structured multi-system approach to addressing the needs of Summit County students prenatally to third grade. And to further inform this approach, we're using a framework that we call the Social Foundations of Educational Attainment. This is the perspective that many factors can influence achievement and attainment, and they don't all occur within the school's walls. This approach considers individual, interpersonal, and community level factors that can each exert an influence on an individual's success. If you've heard of the social determinants of health, this may be familiar to you, but instead we've put educational attainment at the center. Determinants such as physical health, mental health, cognitive development, social capital and connections, spaces and places, and economic resources can significantly impact an individual's opportunities. These factors help us to contextualize many of the outcomes we're seeing in our academic data. This approach will allow us to work collaboratively and across sectors to envision the systems changes that are necessary to ensure success for all students in Summit County. This approach will inform our work in new ways. This helps us to envision, is envision individuals as embedded within environments that influence outcomes from birth to adulthood, for better or worse. This enriches our understanding of achievement and attainment and allows us to go deeper in identifying and targeting the factors that not only impact students, but support them as well. By adopting this approach, we can consider additional sources of data that can help contextualize the experiences of students in the county. We look forward to working with you, our community partners, on broadening our understanding of achievement and attainment and truly addressing the barriers that students experience from cradle to career. To put this in real world terms, we know that life can be challenging and complicated for many of our students. Students who are hungry, without stable housing or income, positive friendships, safe neighborhoods, 
or nurturing families will experience an impact on their education. We're committed to understanding the factors that influence educational outcomes that don't always occur at school. Our partners know this and have seen this. We can build better ways to address these needs. When students are struggling beyond school walls, we can facilitate the development of more timely support systems. No one can do it all to address these factors, but we can do it together. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Matthew Fry, SEI's Director of Data and Applications. And Matthew is going to introduce you to the work he and I've been doing to provide the community and our partners with access to the information and evidence that's necessary to drive our work. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is, uh, thank you, Diana. Um, my name is Matthew Fry. I uh, joined as the Director of Data and Applications uh, in June of this year, actually. Uh, I previously worked at SEI as an undergrad, and I was excited to uh, return in a new capacity. Um, with familiarity uh, of the processes, people, and admissions at SEI, I joined with uh, several goals to help strengthen and man maintain our work going forward. One of our first goals was to develop uh, our community facing dashboards and working with uh, Diana and Annie Boyer, our talented marketing and communications manager. Uh, we were able to build a strong foundation in the dashboards upon which we can continue to develop and disseminate uh, up to date information. Uh, our vision in providing a convenient platform to access pertinent information is to drive targeted support in our community with an organized view of our cradle to career transition points and other meaningful statistics. Uh, we look to weave in and support our recommendations and facilitate action. Um, actually on the scorecards themselves, there's a QR code on the bottom on one side. Um, we have it circled over here actually. And if you get service or you're connected to the Wi-Fi, you can scan that and it'll take you to our, um, our webpage where you'll find links to each of our uh, transition point dashboards. Um, underlying all of my work at SEI is enhancing our data infrastructure. Uh, we are constantly increasing our capabilities to store, organize, and interpret our data uh, while maintaining secure and user-friendly platforms. Uh, in increasing our capabilities, we are confident we can accelerate our work and our development strategies. We are uh, building an environment in which we can be adaptable and where we can respond quickly to changes and in new information. We are putting in place agile systems to increase our rate of development and ensure a co consistent, cohesive, and collaborative environment. Uh, this will benefit our partners uh, as we are increasing our capacity to understand and respond knowledgeably to inquiries and requests. Leveraging our cloud computing platform, we are able to increasingly implement uh, web-based solutions and provide greater ease of use and tra faster transfer of information. Uh, additionally, we are able to increase our turnaround through automated tasks and processes to, again, provide up-to-date and reliable information for our partners. In addition to expanding the cohesiveness of our work environment, we are also expanding the cohesiveness of the tools we create and our goals and recommendations. We understand that many factors combined influence wellness and education in our community. And because of this, our goal is to maintain a student and learner-centered approach. We'll be able to create learner profiles while integrating cross-sector variables in our effort to respond to individual needs. Whether it is traditional school assessments, social emotional assessments, or other factors of health and well-being, we are striving to consolidate these factors to allow us to support wellness through a holistic approach. And this cohesiveness will drive our community-oriented work, but also how we work with our partners. We're making all of our products more intuitive to use and building our system in a way to allow for increased collaboration. Part of doing this is making sure users have easy access across all of our applications and platforms and that to get the information they need. I am highly focused on providing a consistent and logical user experience. And I look forward to working with our partners and facilitators to actively tweak and fit our applications to the needs of our community. I believe we are in a good spot to offer this form of continuous improvement. I'm excited to continue to expand our work through a holistic approach to support the wellness of our students, partners in the community. And with that, I thank you all and I'll turn you back over to Matt. Okay. 
The joke at SEI between Darren and myself was you knew when I didn't know exactly what I was doing, if my hands were moving around a lot as I described what I was trying to do with the technology. Matthew does not have to wave his hands in order to make things work. And we're grateful that he's joined the team. And together, Diana and Matthew are laying out a, a roadmap that can really provide uh, robust information and informed decision making. We are grateful for every member of our team. And I did notice that I did not get the opportunity because of the way the evening was structured to um, single out our newest team member or among our newest team members, uh, Alyssa Figueroa, who will be our three T's project facilitator and out and about in the community in the coming months and years, really expanding our work. Alyssa, could you stand and everybody see you and say hi? So... The next time we get together, I assure you, she will have lots of stories to share about her work. Again, we know that this is a challenging time for all of us, prenatally through the lifespan. We understand that. And I hope that you see in our comments this evening that our focus is not on singling out an individual data point or coming up with a simple solution, but recognizing that this is a complex process that's going to require all of us to work together. We are grateful once again to our presenting sponsors, Lepo Rents, for having us here this evening. I am grateful to all of you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. I would be remiss if I did not let you know that this is the soft launch of our Equity and Achievement Campaign 2021. There is a QR code on the back of your program and on the screen currently, if you were so inclined to invest in our work. I will let you know that funds from the 2020 Equity Achievement Campaign helped us co-develop a college readiness program with our partners at Project Grad Akron and enabled us to underwrite the project where we saw a 20% increase in college readiness scores on uh, the ACT among participating students from Akron Public Schools. That's what the equity and achievement money does. Before you go, I have a few things I need to remind you of. One, we are still a small nonprofit, and so we will be collecting your name tags at the end of the event. We'll have people at the door. We don't want to just throw those away. Those can be sterilized and reused. Two, there are lovely floral arrangements on the tables every year. I like to think that they just magically appear, but they're all because K. Rowe knows how to make things look really nice. Um, and whoever's birthday it is closest to today is welcome to take the floral arrangement home with them. If that person is not interested, then anybody else at the table is also welcome to take it home. I assure you, I cannot take any more than one floral arrangement home. We've all at SEI tried it one time or another. It's a very wet situation to take four or five of these. So please take, take home the flowers. Also, if you need parking validation and you didn't get a sticker earlier, we can also make sure that you get that on your way out. Thank you again, everyone, for your time this evening and your partnership. We appreciate you. You're broken down at